Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pervasive Media Studio and this afternoon's lunchtime talk. Our talks are every Friday at 1pm, both here in the building and live online. So whether you're in Bristol or further away, you can join in the conversation. My name's Jo Lansdowne. I'm executive producer of Pervasive Media Studio. I'm a 40-year-old white woman with shortish blonde hair wearing a T-shirt with a lemon on it. Um, so every Friday, we throw open the doors of Pervasive Media Studio for Open Studio Friday, where we offer you the chance to spend time here in the space by hot desking alongside our residents and, talk, um, and staff every Friday from 10 to 5. And so especially big welcome to anyone here who's new to the studio. Have we got anyone who's not been here before? Oh, brilliant. Welcome. Um, so this bit is particularly for you and anyone online who would like to know a little bit more about us. Um, so we are a diverse and collaborative community exploring creative technology with everything from comedy to coding, product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, um, University of the West of England and the University of Bristol and funded by Arts Council England. So we offer um, space for people to take risks with new ideas. That means the studio space here, um, but also a programme of kind of events and connections as part of a spirit of generosity and mutual exchange. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, please feel free to move around if you'd like to. You can make a cup of tea for yourself or grab a glass of water in the kitchen at the back there. Um, please don't use the microwave during the talk because it interferes with our loop system. Um, just to the left here, we've got a quiet space. So if you need to take a break at any point for any reason, then please do so. Um, and accessible toilets and baby change are in the corridor just next to the kitchen. So there'll be a Q&A at the end of the talk. Um, if you're watching online, please put your questions into the chat um, and we'll make sure they reach Tom. Um, and if you're in the building, you can just put your hand up and I will bring you a microphone. Um, so you can get news on all of our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk slash studio at PM Studio UK on Twitter at Pervasive Media Studio at mastodon.social on Mastodon. I hate this bit. At Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram. <coughs> Um, so I think that's that bit done. Um, so I'm really delighted to introduce Tom Abba, who's going to give our talk today. Tom is a long-standing resident of Pervasive Media Studio and director of the Digital Cultures Research Centre, which is the bit of UE based here in the studio. Um, and we're really pleased that he's here to talk to us about his latest work. Thank you, Joe. Okay, hi, and hi to the interwebs. For the record, I am a, mid a white man in his mid-50s, yes, mid-50s, wearing a dark grey t-shirt, black jeans, and I have a beard. Um, for, also, for the record, this t-shirt is rarely not spattered with baby sick. <laughs> she tried this morning, but I was too fast. <laughs> she got the sofa instead. Okay, um, I haven't done one of these for ages. Um, I think it's six years since the last time I stood up and actually did a talk in the studio, so I'm a little bit out of practice. I will waffle, I will wonder. Martin, I'm sorry, I'll probably stand in the middle and go to one side and to the left. But as Joe said, I've been around the studio for a long, long time. Um, I'm currently, I'm presently director of the Digital Cultures Research Centre, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm an artist, I'm someone who works with creative technology, and I'm somebody who makes books that don't behave like books. Um, my practice arises out of an illustrative practice and a kind of fine art practice and found its way into creative technology about 10, 12 years ago. And since then, I've kind of carved out a little niche for myself working within that form and for me at least trying to figure out what of my kind of craft practice translates across and then how does that translate and how does that unpack and what does that mean for audiences with the kind of stories I want to tell. Um, this talk is about a project. It's about a project called From Bitter Ground. I'll come on and do the usual um, sales pitch right at the end. If you want to know more that I can fit into the next 40 minutes or so, bitterground.substack.com. Um, I started a newsletter in January to kind of pre-launch this piece. There are currently about 27,000 words of content that if you want to take a deep dive into anything I cover today, then I think there are sort of 17 or 18 newsletters that were published in the first three or four months of the year rolling out. 
And if you did subscribe, thank you very much. You made me feel very happy when people actually read the damn thing. But <clears throat> where to begin? Where does anything begin? Um, this is a piece of work by an architect called Gordon Matter Clark. Matter Clark was American. He died really young in the early 80s. This is a piece of work called Conical Intersect, made in 1975. I can do the show of hands. Anyone know Gordon Matter Clark's work? Brilliant. Okay. Um, he was a proponent of what he called Anna architecture, um, or an architecture, in a kind of response to modern architecture's kind of position as a modernist practice. And Matter Clark was interested in how do we break that down? How, how can we become more playful in that? So the first image on, I'm going to go back and what well, I shouldn't do, that's also a Matter Clark work. That's called splitting. That's the first piece of Matter Clark's work that I came across when I was an illustration student in Bristol in the early 90s. It's a house in America that's been cut in two by a handsaw and very carefully winched down so that you can just see the piles at the bottom that break things open. Most of the work he made was temporary. Um, it existed for a short period of time. It was incredibly dangerous to witness in addition to make. So this piece, there was a version of this stage in New York and a version staged in Paris. He's literally cutting holes in the building. He's cutting holes out of the architecture which, as any architect or planning surveyor will tell you, is incredibly risky, and the thing will fall down. And often, the works he made were in spaces that were going to be condemned. Um, they were going to be rebuilt, refurbished, re sort of torn down in that kind of period in the 1970s and early 80s, where America was reinventing itself. But this is about immersive media, not about Gordon Matter Clark. That body of work, Matter Clark's body of work, kind of profoundly affected me when I first saw it. It wasn't work I wanted to make, I wasn't interested in being an architect, but I was really interested in what he was doing with space, in how that spoke to, to somebody who wanted to make 2D work, who at that point was interested in collage, and some of these are still around here for this project. And what really struck me about Matter Clark's work was a subversion of space, a subversion of what we expected to see. And in relation to this, what I think is worth kind of bouncing to is this quote. Rather than the uncanny, and <clears throat> the title of this talk originally was Form Function and the Uncanny Experience. I kind of modified it to be Form Content because I'm more familiar with talking about that as an aphorism. But there's a wonderful text by a writer called Nicholas Royal in which he, he breaks down into a two-sentence version what the uncanny and the eerie are. Um, and Royal says that the uncanny is the presence of what ought to be absent, and the eerie is the absence of what ought to be present. Brilliant. Anything that gets you a whole canon of work down to two sentences. This, to me, is the evolution of that, because those two phrases are really useful, but they get you locked into a whole history of, of Freud, of psychoanalysis, of thinking about the death drive, of thinking about where, these, where those experiences that disturb us come from. The weird is probably a more contemporary way of explaining that. This quote is from Mike Harrison's anti-memoir, which I'd recommend to anybody in the room. Um, Serpent's Tale sent me a copy. I don't know why, but they sent me a copy, and it's a wonderful thing. Um, it's a book about writing, but it's a book about writing written by somebody in their late 70s who spent his entire career working at the edges of fiction, at the edges of what's, what we see as orthodox, as contemporary, as kind of safe ground. Mike was one of the new wave of science fiction writers in the 60s, has kind of emerged through and become a weird fiction writer now. And this quote, the weird is a way of writing about the real. It evolved slowly across the 20th century and then faster than the eye could follow across the first two decades of the 21st. You can read that as much as I can. There's something about that that relates, for me, back to this image. It's weird. It's not uncanny, it's not eerie, although there are, if I go back to Royal's kind of definition, there are things about that are both uncanny and eerie. There is an absence of what ought to be present, there is a presence of what ought to be absent. There are things in that image, and if I want to, and I am a kind of very mechanical creator, I want to know why I think certain things and why I respond in certain ways, mostly because I think that's how we learn, or it's how I learn. If I can decode that responsive mode, that moment of affect, I felt something, why did I feel that thing? Because frankly, I can then copy it and figure out what I can do with it. There's something really helpful about the uncanny and the eerie in relation to Matter Clark's work, but also in what Mike says about the weird. 
And the rejoinder to that phrase is this one. <clears throat> a weird text may not add up. It may not resolve. In fact, it almost certainly won't. Nevertheless, there'll be no signposts. The author is not on this tour to guide you. The author's work has been to strip out the effects, affects, conclusions, and motivations, then replace them out of order and at an odd angle. That, by way of kind of unpacking, is my approach to making immersive media. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the work I make now and where it comes from in the next 15, 20 minutes. But for me, there is a, there is a very different mode of having an audience to engage with a piece of immersive work than having them engage with a book. This is a blindingly obvious thing to say, but I want to unpack this for a moment in that this is a finished thing. This, is a, this has been carefully designed. Someone laid the text out. Obviously, someone wrote it, edited it, but someone laid the text out, packaged it. You can buy it in any bookstore up and down the country. You can order it on <clears throat> Amazon. Um, you can own your own copy, and that copy is exactly the same as everybody else's copy. Obviously, what you bring to it, what your history with early 1960s science fiction, with weird writing in the 21st century is going to be yours, but the thing is a thing. The thing is a fixed object. And I think, certainly for the work that I've made on my own, um, as part of the Ambient Literature Project, which I'll come on to in a moment, with Duncan Speakman, that's his first mention, um, these things, to me at least, work as a set of elements. They are, if you like, conceptually, a set of things that are kind of thrown out into the world that the audience will then reassemble or put into their own order. You are more present in a piece of immersive work than you are with a book. You're obviously present when you're reading a book. You're a person, you're a thing. But you're not being asked to do anything other than read. You're not being asked to engage. Your, your forward motion is very much guided by the affordances of the object. I'll get onto book design and why I think book design needs a kick up the arse in about 20 minutes. But there's a fundamental difference. And I think from a, from a design point of view, understanding what all those elements are is really critical. I spent a long time about the time my PhD was being completed, about 15 years ago, working around the edges of what was then called transmedia design, transmedia projects, which were, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, if you are, they're still around. They were early kind of alternate reality games, narratives seated over the internet that had a number of different elements that the audience brought together. They also specifically worked around with mass participation. They worked really, really well when you had 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people across a continent or more coming together into a space and solving a, prob solving a problem, solving a series of puzzles to advance a narrative, to unpack something. They were a really, 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 really interesting phase of that kind of digital narrative, digital development. Um, but they were elements. They were bits. They relied on a set of readers to resolve things in order to move forward. They were also on rails for the most part. And although none of my notes have this phrase in them, none of them are choose your own adventures. None of them are that kind of branching narrative form that is a very easy way to imagine what digital storytelling is. They're an on rails story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. They have an author. They have a kind of authorial responsibility that you're going to run from all the way through to the conclusion. And what you hope is an author, as an author of a transmedia work is that your audience is smart enough, bright enough, or collaborative enough to solve all those things in the right order and get to the end. And that, by way of saying, is I think that influences my approach to making this kind of work. I'm interested in things that are largely on rails. They are a story. I'm a writer. I'm an author. I think that comes with a certain level of responsibility. I want to tell you a story. I want you to be surprised by the kind of story I tell you and the way in which it's told, but you're still going to be told a story. I need to understand what those elements are, but I also, I hope, need to be thoughtful enough about how I've designed them that they make sense. Some of the more egregiously bad examples of transmedia literally threw everything in the kitchen sink at the project. So you had websites that led to other websites that led to a rabbit hole of this and this, and there's a point at which they become they fall down under the weight of their own pretension. There is something pure about keeping it simple, keeping it running through. But um, if that's the quote, then the other thing about this that speaks to immersive media is this last sentence, to replace them out of order and at an odd angle. Because if 
Even if a piece of work is designed to be on rails, designed to run from A to B to C to D to E to F and to hit a conclusion, when I give it to a, a reader, to a participant, they're going to play with it in different ways. The first thing they're going to do is break it for a start, or they'll break it at some point. But that then changes the role of the writer. It changes the role of the writer into being something more of an architect or an experienced designer to kind of lean into a phrase that had currency and probably still does. Which brings us on to bitter ground. So, I'm guessing you're here because either you wandered in from the Pervasive Media Studio or it's too warm outside, or you've got some vague interest in this piece of work. Um, from Bitter Ground started two and a half years ago. Um, it began with a car journey. Um, we'd just, in the summer of 2020, re-released a project called These Pages Fall Like Ash, which was originally made in the studio 10 years ago. Um, and the second edition came out in 2020. It was put out as a, I'll say optimistically, a post-pandemic piece. Um, it's a piece for a single reader. You decide where you walk, you map a site, you map a journey, <clears throat> and you're told a story over a period of time. It felt like a piece to re-release in the summer of 2020, when hopefully at that point we were coming out of the first lockdown. It felt sensitive to the world in which we were in. One of the things that I was trying to do with these pages was ask each reader to see the world differently, to reimagine their surroundings and to look at what they felt was familiar in a different way. And that felt really pertinent to where we were in 2020. Anyway, we released it, it went out, it did fairly well. Um, if you bought a copy, thank you very much. Um, it's in every continent and I think 35 countries across the world. And it still copies trickle out every now and again. It's a really lovely thing. Um, but what surprised me about these pages was people bought two copies. It was a piece of work designed for one reader. It has two books um, bound obversely. So there is a book that starts there and there's a book that starts there. And they meet, they don't really meet in the middle, but they do kind of conceptually meet in the middle. A lot of people in that first run bought two copies and they bought a copy for themselves and one for a friend. And they wanted to experience something in the middle of a global pandemic, as they kind of emer we emerged out of that first wave of COVID, it felt like there was a desire to connect again, to connect with somebody that you couldn't talk to or you couldn't talk to in person, to have a shared experience. And that really struck me about the potential of this kind of work. I've made and I've been part of teams that have made work for paired readers for multiple audiences, but that idea that you're making something that is for one reader here and one reader there, and how do I make them connect, felt like a really interesting question to answer. And I'm an academic, so most of the things I make start with a question to answer. It's a thing I'm trying to get to the bottom of. But that first conversation in a car driving to Devon um, was me turning to my partner and saying, what, happened if, what would happen if I sent everybody a book and unbeknownst to them, there was a second one in the post that would arrive a week and a half later. And that's not the piece of work I ended up making, but that idea that there is something interesting about the mechanic of ordering online and being sent something in the post. There is something uncontrollable about that. If I go into Waterstones or Story Smiths or whatever bookshop you want to name and buy a copy of Mike Harrison's Wish I Was Here, I know what I'm getting. I'm buying it, I'm picking it off the shelf, I'm paying with a book token or a credit card or whatever, but that's my thing. If I'm ordering from an unknown source, let's assume we're not ordering from the great website in the sky that sends us books really cheaply, I'm ordering from a person who's going to send me something. I don't know what they're going to send me. I trust they're going to send me the thing I ordered. But often my most delightful ordering independently made experiences are things that come with other things. They come with a set of postcards or a badge or something. And that to me is fundamentally really delightful. There's a human connection there that I didn't expect. I get something more and I find that, I still find that charming when things arrive. And obviously, independent book designer in Ireland is trying to sell me other things, but I still find that lovely, that I can be surprised by that. And so, the heart of Bitter Ground was, what can I do with that sense of unexpectedness? 
how can I play with that and how can I explore that? One of the other things I wanted to do with it was to write a prologue. Um, there's a French literary theorist who died five, six years ago called Gérard Jeannette. See, I'm an academic, you're going to get a lecture. Um, and Jeannette, among other things, gave us a concept called paratext. And for Jeannette, paratext is best described as all the things that go into our reading of an object before we open it, before we read the first page. So let's go back to Mike Harrison's Wish I Was Here. It's a hardbound book. It has white text on a torn, really day-glow green cover with fragments underneath it. I can open it and I find the usual kind of guide and indicia on the front, down to previous books by the author. All these things, I'm not going to spend this 20 minutes talking about paratextual objects here, but they tell me something about the thing before I read it. They're the things I bring to it. And one of the other questions with Bitter Ground is, what's the paratext for an immersive work? What are the things that, what's the onboarding experience? What's the guide? What's the way in for the audience? And as a writer, as a designer, as someone who's made this thing that I want to sell you and I trust that you're going to pay money for and I'm going to send you, what am I not doing? Or what haven't I done before that I can do now? And so there is a prologue to From Bitter Ground. Um, it's free to read. There'll be a link right at the end if you want to open create an account, you can go and, and read the prologue entirely for free for yourself before you buy the books. It was designed within the frame of the piece to be the thing that you get when you've paid your money before you get your books. Which is the other thing that bothered me about making books that don't behave like books in an immersive experience frame. Because when I go into a bookshop and pick up a thing, then I have it, I owned it, I paid my money, it's there and that's it. When I'm ordering something, and I felt very guilty sending books out to Europe, to the United States, to anywhere in the world in end of 2020, it might be three days, it might be five days, in some cases it was three months before that book would arrive. And I wanted to design something that was the gap, the thing that sat in there, that said, okay, you have committed to this, you have made an investment of money or time or commitment, here is a little taster, here is a thing that is part of what comes next but it's the bit you get to do before your book arrives, before the thing hits here. This is from the prologue. <clears throat> I'd like you to find somewhere, somewhere specific, and it should be a place you can revisit, that you'll find again and feel is familiar. It's not a specific place that we can predetermine, but rather a kind of location. It's a place somewhere near you where you are now that might have been a home or it could have been. It might be abandoned, a burned out shell, an unfinished building. It might be in a zone that's marked off in some way. What's important is that it's yours, that you feel you belong there somehow. There isn't an absolutely right place either, just the right one for you. The prologue is a lot longer than that, and the prologue actually asks you to find your site, to find this site that's somewhere near you that may have once been a house that could be an abandoned building, it could be the end of a terrace that was never finished, that you walk past every day, but what Bitter Ground does is ask you to look at it again. And you map the site in the prologue. Or rather, your phone maps the site for you because it's a piece of digital technology that merges books and digital media. And then you're going to come back to it four times. The piece is designed to work over four successive days, but it can run over four days that you space apart by a number of weeks. It's entirely up to you how you do it. Um, but the four-day run is the minimum length of time that we're asking you to do within this. And then what you get is this. And I will happily, I'll send one round. If you haven't got a copy of Bitter Ground, this is what it looks like. Um, when it arrives, where's my other prop? In fact, be down to it. <clears throat> a copy of From Bitter Ground, open the envelope. Feel free. It's the same thing as you've got there. Um, it's a set of books. Open it, absolutely. I have spares, don't worry. <laughs> it's a set of books that arrive as a paired object. So they arrive in a brown envelope, there's a black envelope and a white envelope. What you've been told in advance is that you get to keep one and give one to somebody else. 
I can anticipate you've read the prologue or walked the prologue, but that's not necessary at this point. You may just have picked this up and run away with it and that's your thing, and that's what it is. The books are designed to be an accompaniment to the digital narrative. And that's just for this project. They're not a version of the narrative. They don't map directly into what happens over the prologue and those then four successive days, but they inform how you read it, I hope. They inform the way in which you might approach this piece of work and what you take from it and what you understand from it. And they comprise three books contained in one. The first one is a concertina. There's a reason there's a concertina I'll come back to in about three minutes. Um, there are then two books, one called The Book of Entrances, which reads and operates like a conventional text-ish. And, sorry, that was The Book of Exits. And The Book of Entrances that unpacks to be a rather large and somewhat clumsy to pack OS map. And I was, other than being a complete arse about making books and wanting to make something like that, I was really interested in how each reader reads those three objects of what you take from them. Because in my run of a piece on rails, you've probably read the prologue, I hope, or you've encountered the prologue. You've got something of the tone and the tenor and the taste of the piece, but nothing's really happened yet. Nothing of any consequence. And then you get these things. And they contain text, they contain image. All the collages are handmade. Um, that's what I do. But they are designed to be, if not unreadable, then difficult to encounter. They're designed to tease. They're designed, they are paratextual objects as well because they are the paratext for what comes next. They're the paratext for the next four days, for the thing you're gonna unpack and run your way through. And just a word on the paired experience, Bitter Ground is designed to be read by two readers. Um, following that kind of initial conversation, the thoughts all the way through, the idea is that you find a friend and you send them the, the other copy of the book. They can be in the same city, they can be a thousand miles away, they can be on the other side of the planet. Your accounts are linked and the houses you choose are therefore linked. And your progress, to a certain extent, is linked in the piece. I'm also not going to spoil anything about the text, so I'm not going to go too deep into what happens in that, but that causal linking, that how do I design a piece of work that is, designed, that is intended to be read by two parallel people, or two parallel readers, who are having different experiences, and anyone who's got, you know, read things through, there's a different URL whether you've got a black, cop, black envelope or a white envelope. The prologue is the same, then the two stories do that. And they sit and run parallel over day one, day two, day three and day four, and they talk to each other. Now, of course, they don't talk to each other, we hope you talk to each other. But that's kind of the, the map within it. But, this is my one bit of spoiler that no one gets before you start it. The whole thing is an Aruboros. It's a snake eating its own tail. Um, and within the frame of making an immersive work that has a book at its heart, because I'm a book designer, because I work with physical media, then the thing I'm really especially interested in is how we read those things that you've got in your hand now and what they tell you about the experience to come. So the paratextual elements are, I hope, not just about the design, about the imagery, about the way in which that thing's constructed, but actually about the object themselves. And notably for Bitter Ground, <clears throat> if that's the book that contains the other books, there is no beginning and there is no end. A concertina has a cover there and we can read it all the way through, but then we get to the other one and we get to the next cover, and then we go back round and we read the whole thing. There was definitely a version of this where everything sealed at the top, but that's really complicated to create. <laughs> but everything within the work is circular. Each day is a circular experience. Your connection with your paired partner is a circular experience. The books, at least, the concertina is a circular experience. And because one of the design strictures I've given myself was you're going to map a site and come back to it four times, the other thing, as a writer, I was really interested in is, what can I do with that? How do I make that not boring? 
You pick a house, you're going to go and map five points, it's going to tell you certain things about the decisions you made, about the way in which you mapped that, and then you're going to come back the next day. And you're going to walk the same five points. And the next day, and oddly enough, you walk the same five points. And the day after, and you walk the same five points. And then the last day is... Structurally, that's what it does. Narratively, it does something very different. And I hope... We'll see, it's been out for a couple of months now, and I'm starting to get the first bits of people... The first responses from people who've read the whole thing. I think what happens between days does change the way in which you look at your rewalking of that site. If I say any more, I mean to spoil a territory, but there are... If I know one of the affordances I'm giving you is that you have a fixed site and you're going to rewalk it, so you're going to absorb it, you're going to experience it, you're going to, you're, you're going to inhabit that site. And what that site is asking you to do, because the first thing the bit of ground asks you is to find a house that isn't there. But you imagine a house to be there. And you imagine a house with history. And you imagine a house that things have happened in and that are going to happen to you over the next four days. What the narrative is trying to do is to play with that repeated idea, to play with what a return is, with why we come back, how things change when we come back, and actually, very slight, small less spoiler, how we have changed between day one and day two and day two and day three and day three and day four and what happens in it. And that's, that's the guts of the piece. Um, we are halfway through. Just some thoughts about the broader frame. Um, this is... This is a thing called the Panther Prophecy. It's from 1661. In design would not appear for another 330 years. Quark Express 315. Publishing has got a lot to answer for. <laughs> if someone working with letterpress and handmade type and handmade design can make that in 1661, why are books so astonishingly dull? <laughs> there is an entire Substack essay where I rant and swear quite a lot about the state of book design. I don't have a problem with books. I have a problem with the, the paucity of ambition in what books can do. If I give you... If I give you a book, if I give anybody that I encounter a book that's an orthodox thing, you know how to read it. You know how the cover relates to the internal pages. You know how chapters work, because these are things that we literally rewire our kids' brains at the age of four or five to learn to read. We do that. I'm doing that with a five-year-old now, and she's going through and knowing what page what She doesn't understand it. Um, but from a design and a writing point of view, the novel has become a fairly fixed form. And that, I think, is a tremendous shame. I spent a lot of time talking to publishing, working around the edges of publishing, and trying to persuade publishers that there are more interesting ways to make books, to engage a reader, to think about what technology can do. Because when we have InDesign, when we have desktop publishing, when we, we move beyond metal type, there are some amazing things we can do. And there's some amazing things we can do when we've still got metal type. Um, but there are very few examples of that really being thought through and seen in commercial publishing, in a commercial press. So, you know, I could name Ryan Hughes's XX, Daniel James is the authorised, unauthorised biography of Ezra Mars, Stephen Hall's Raw Shark Text, Mark Danielewski's House of Leaves. There's a fairly thin list of books that have made the design of the object and how the object relates to the text and to the narrative a function of what they do. And that will always be the case. That will be the thing. A Netflix series behaves like a Netflix series. Um, a film behaves like a film. We, we read things in certain ways and we absorb things because we're familiar. But I do think there's space to play at the edge. And so for me, working with the object, working with a book as a thing, as the central thing that you know you have, and coming back to a piece of work that's on rails but is going to be read by somebody anywhere and anywhere, that's the one thing I do know about you. You've got that in your hand. So that, in terms of an authorial control, is the one thing I can mandate. You've got that book. You don't get to do the rest of it until you've got that book in your hand. OK. Rant over. I ran a research project based out of here with the University of Bath, sorry, Bath Spa and Birmingham University called Ambient Literature. This is, for me, the most important thing that I did in that two-year research project. We spent 
two years commissioning work, making work that operated in this broad space. Um, what does immersive experience, what, what happens when immersive experiences meet literary form? What kind of work can we make? And we made three or four pieces of work. We made some pieces of work around the edge. This, for me, this was the bit that happened right at the end. This was when trying to write the book, because you write a book, because that's what you do. Um, if anyone's interested in ambient literature or form and you can't afford 30 quid or 60 quid or whatever else I sell it, email me, I'll send you a PDF. There is a complicated reason to do with signing contracts that don't have royalties on them. Um, but I'd rather it was read. But this was the crux. This was the thing for me where looking at the pieces of work we've made and trying to decode what was happening in them, why they were specific, was a way to think about how we make work. Because all the things we commissioned had these seven factors working in them. And they're not a set thing. Um, they were a way of looking at a very narrow canon of work that we've made and saying there are some common things happening in all these pieces of work. And I can very simply, very, very lazily scale and go, okay, this is for Bitter Ground. Bitter Ground has a temporality score of nine. It has a performance score of two. It's asking you to respond and it's designed in different ways. And I'm really, really suspicious about anybody who has one of these as a design tool in a kind of weirdly schizophrenic way. I don't like starting a piece of work going, I'm going to make a piece that has an unpredictability score of 10. <laughs> and that's, but I think there's a point in which, there's a point during the writing where actually I found this really useful on several occasions to stop and reflect, to think actually, what is it that I'm doing? What things in there, how is this piece of work behaving? And embodied reading, for example, this is my very quick summary of what's in that chapter. In that the work talks to you. The work knows you exist. Because the work is mediated by digital technology. And one of the things that these things do is they know who we are. They know where we've been. They can probably predict where we're going to go. My kids are constantly amused that my phone flags up. It's time to go to the swimming pool on a Wednesday. Um, because I've done that every second week for the last three years. Those are tools for a storyteller, if we want to use them that way. Temporality. One of the things that I've noticed about the work we made under ambient literature, and actually a lot of the work I've made since, is that it plays with time. It plays with our perceptions of time and how we understand time. The piece may be about time, but that's not really what temporality is about there. But that our experience of time within a piece or experiencing the way the story is being told, because we are present in that moment. We're not just sitting in a chair reading a book. We are acting, we are performing, we are moving through space. Somehow becomes tied up in that. Reflexive technology that, my shorthand phrase is a smartphone is not a neutral carrier of story. One of the purposes of a book as a writer is for it to disappear. I would argue. What I don't want someone to remember, to feel in that moment of immersion while reading a novel or reading a short story is they're reading a book. The book's meant to vanish. Experiencing cinema is you're meant to forget you're in a cinema and you're just absorbed in the world. Theatre obviously has a whole different, but the purpose of the fray, the medium is to vanish. It's very difficult to make this thing vanish. If this is the means to which you're telling a story, then this becomes part of the toolkit. It becomes part of the tool set. So reflexive technology was a way of describing the phone, the device has a purpose. And this set were designed to work with ambient literature. They obviously they unpack in different ways. And if we wrote that book again, they change. They change because the canon has changed because we've made different work. But at the time, that's still a really, really helpful thing for me to unpack what it is. Um, to briefly run down in the last 10 minutes or so some bits about the project, this is from the first version, and I still really, really miss it. There was a version of Bitter Ground that was very folk horror influenced, that ran with four days, each day representing a season, and you run the entire calendar year in a year that never happened because it's when you were a child, but you've forgotten it. And it's included there partly because I want to see it on a really big screen, and, but I made all the individual artwork for this, then made the book and hated it instantly. 
and spent a day sitting quietly, not quite sobbing to myself, going, it's just shit. <laughs> and it doesn't work, and it fights everything else. And I think there's a point where, in every project, you have to step away, you have to stop, and you have to think about, what am I trying to make? And certainly, at that point in making the piece, I'd become very, very attached to the aesthetic to the idea of a certain kind of narrative, a certain kind of way of telling a story. And I think my recollection is that afternoon of quietly thinking, why am I wasting my life on this, was when I went back to that. I said, actually, what's the kind of story I'm trying to tell? How do I lean into this? What's the bit I've forgotten? Because I'm just so in love with the idea of telling a folk horror story about your childhood, about a thing that you've forgotten. I've not even thought about any of these things. So the toolkits are helpful and somehow critical and somehow useful. Um, but this is what the whole thing ended up looking like. Um, it became very monotone, it became very black and white, there's very little colour in the piece. I found a book of, actually I'll confess, I found David Lynch's Factory Photographs book which I mined mercilessly with photocopies and overlays and transparencies and manipulated and cut and sliced and then found abandoned factories around Bristol and took my own. It became an aesthetic. It became a thing that worked. That going from this kind of haunted English pastoral to this felt like a really big shift, but fundamentally it's the same story. It's still a piece of work that takes place over a number of days. It's still, it's about a period of time that is uncertain in when it happens. But this gave it weight, it gave it a sense of this is where it's going. And that then informed the design of the whole piece, it informs the, the way in which the interactive elements or the, the immersive bits that are digitally mediated operate. And it gave me space to play. And before I got to this point, there was only a concertina book, there wasn't the other two books. There was a sense to which I knew where it was going, I knew where the piece wanted to go, but I didn't have the apparatus to make that work. Also, I was coming back to the idea of reflexive technology, I was very conscious that I wasn't making a piece of immersive theatre. One of the things that surprised me about relaunching these pages for Lacash in 2020 was we tried to get press, we tried to do the thing that you do with a piece of work and I had a publicist who was brilliant and completely insane. Um, she's David Mitchell's publicist the writer, not the comedian. So she knows how to work with experimental media. And she, did, she taught me a huge amount over six weeks of working with somebody prof who professionally operates in that space. We didn't get a single line of copy in any newspaper on anything. Nobody touched it. We are still, and I will wear this badge to my dying day, we are, I quote, too highbrow for Steve Wright in the afternoon. But we fell between a whole set of stools. But what Nikki taught me was there is a way of describing your work that talks to different audiences that reminded me of things we'd done on these pages for like Ash originally about how you frame the work. And what was really interesting about the launch for these pages is it found, the project found traction with an immersive theatre audience, which at the time was completely delightful and completely, oh my God, there's a whole set of people out there that I, I hadn't spoken to before and I wasn't aware there are fan communities for Punch Drunk. Of course there are fan communities for Punch Drunk. But at that time, nobody could do immersive theatre. Middle of 2020, every production was shut down and suddenly we, there was a piece of work out there. And that, coming to the end of this project, that's really influenced the way I think about the kind of work this is and the kind of means of engagement. Is I've described it as immersive theatre without a stage. That the book is your stage, or your presence within that is still part of the experience. But there are no, there isn't a cast of actors, there are no masks, there is no performance happening. It's just you. But that language is really, really helpful still to think about it. Although I'm going to run away from it with the next project and go back to books. But it opens up a set of doors as to how I describe the work and how I think about the work operating. Um, and the other thing, which I'll just spoil for a second, is that this is also a mirror. And there are moments in Bitter Ground where you're asked to remember that the phone in your hand is a reflective surface, which I completely thanked Duncan for about 10 years ago, of playing with that idea of what are the things that the phone gives you that we forget, that we forget it does. They're not technological, they're not about data, they're not about the thing knowing where you are, they're just about the object. 
about what we all have in our pockets and we forget we've got in our pockets. Okay, last two. What I didn't expect was I'd need to learn how to make three typefaces as part of this project. That I'd need to learn new skills and things I didn't know how to do, that I would end up spending a huge amount of time repairing typewriters last summer to make them work again, to make them run, and then thinking about how to typewriter typefaces work. But actually, in terms of the scale of the piece, that was probably present from the start. I just didn't see it coming in. And I think having now made this, and this has been two and a half years in the making, I'm ready for something different. I'm ready for something simpler, but I still really value the deep dive that Bitter Ground has given me into really thinking about a, a large scale piece of work and how that operates. But finally, and we are coming up on quarter two. Um, this is where I'm going to leave the talk. That link is to the prologue. You're welcome to scan. Um, I checked it does work from the back of the room. You might need to zoom your phone in a little bit. That will take you to a login page that opens up the prologue for you. I can take questions. In terms of ambient literature, the project was kind of on hiatus for a little while after 2018 when our funding period stopped, um, largely because the university had me run REF, which is a whole different story. and We don't want to go near that. We're relaunching it this autumn. There will be a two-day symposium um, that's tentatively called the Ambient Frame that will run with Arnold Feeney and I hope Watershed in the spring um, with invited speakers to talk about the kind of work and the kind of work that we might make if we reframe that project. There are other things that's going to happen, but yeah, thank you for listening. <clears throat>I'm so tempted to ask, like, but what's it about? It's about haunted um, houses. But <laughs> <laughs> it's about haunted I'm, houses I'm and it's about a haunted house. <laughs> myself next week. Do we have any questions in the room? I'm going to give you a microphone. It doesn't amplify your voice, but allows the people online <laughs> right, to hear okay. you. Um, you mentioned there's a white envelope and a black envelope. Yeah. Are there any differences with the content? And can you, like, do it once and then do it with the other piece? Two questions. There are no differences in the content at all. Um, they are the same set of books that you get if you get the white envelope or the black envelope, but the, the little handy guide, the URL is different if you've got the black envelope or the white envelope. Yes, absolutely. One of the ways to read it solo is read the white, read one version, either create a different account under a different email address or wipe your account at the end and read the other version, and it works perfectly well. Um, you could, if you wanted to be really awkward, have two phones or two accounts running in different browsers on the same phone, which would probably work. And you could find two houses and read the two things separate. It's designed for two people. I was really interested in how do you make something that is contingent on, if it's Joe and I doing it, on me doing the, both of us doing the prologue, me doing day one, Joe having a really shit week at work and not getting around to doing day one until later on. How does that actually operate and how, does that, how do those accounts talk to each other? Um, and how does your experience not become diffused by that? But yeah, you can totally do it by yourself. It, some of the affects work better with a pair. And could you do it with someone else, but in the same space? Yes. Oh yeah, good I had yes. that question. I've got mine ready at home to do next week. Yes, so, yeah. you absolutely can. I would be really interested to know what happens with the mapping instructions on the prologue. In that without, it's the product, it's, you're asked to walk a certain distance. You're asked to walk a minute away from the site that you choose. And I'd be really interested to know if you choose different spaces or whether you walk together and so what it will do. Because there are things that happen between day one and day two. So yes, but I don't know what happens completely if you do that like that. Thank you. Tom, if people are um, experiencing from bitter ground are the, and they... You're obviously interested in how they do that. Is there a way of feeding back to you or sharing those? Um, yeah, obviously. I mean, I'm on Twitter at Tom Abba. You've got my email address when you buy a copy of the book. All those things are kind of implicit. I mean, most of the questions I've had so far are as, um, the link doesn't work or it broke on day one, or which we've fixed all those little bits that you do in teething. But yeah, we've, and I've had some people who've, written, who've done the whole thing and are interested in what happens at the end. Any Carefully avoiding questions? a spoiler.
Um, I'm actually just really new to the concept of ambient liter literature, and I wondered what other examples there were of this kind of work that I could check out. Absolutely. Okay. Um, thank you, Laura Tim. So the project, so the project builds on work that Duncan and I have made previous to 2016. Um, and so I think, I mean, a hollow body probably isn't still up, but it runs in London. It was a piece made for the Museum of London's Sherlock Holmes exhibition. Um, I'm sure we could find you the MP3 files and you go and walk it within the project itself. So these pages fall like ash was just before ambient lit. It's kind of one of the things that kind of triggered our interest in narrative in this space. Within the project itself, um, Duncan's It Must Have Been Dark by Then is there, it still runs. He's online, I hope, so he can sort of flag if it doesn't. But I've got a spare copy of the book if you want to go out and walk it. Um, Kate Pullinger's Breathe was, was created by Google Creative Labs and as far as I know still works. Um, breathe.story.com or just Google Kate Pullinger and Breathe. James Atley's Cartographer's Confession, I think, is no longer available. I think we suffered one of those moments where the App Store take things down when they update it. So, yeah, those are the pieces of work that are still extant. There's a whole other body of stuff, of work that we would think about as being in that Venn diagram and not in it. You know, that we, we weren't trying to co-opt a whole lot of body of work within ambient literature and say, this is ambient literature. What we were interested in doing is saying, when you put story first, rather than say play or experience, what happens? How does that kind of change the way in which you make the work going forward? Now, can drop me an email, I'll send you links. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, it was great. Uh, I'm really afraid of asking a question to be very conventional, but mm. I have to ask. Um, I'm an architect myself, and uh, whenever we try to kind of create an experience for people in terms of space and uh, design, uh, we don't know how what's what going to happen. But there might be some hopes of those experiences because it still comes through us, yeah. right? And depends on who we are, but I think there are some sort of like, ah, they didn't get it, or, yeah. oh, wow, they surprised us, some sort of this. And how open we are to some disappointments <laughs> mm -hmm. in a way. I'm curious to know in terms of the experience with, a, with an artifact, with a book, which is not a book, which is, uh, I was just observing myself opening this and mm. thinking of, uh, I got also annoyed at some point, like, <sighs> yeah. mm -hmm. you know, even though I wanted to be experimental and yeah. mm. anyway, uh, it's just like a mix of different feelings, but I, there's a really, one of the things that struck me about the way in which I talked about ambient literature toward the end of the project from the start, so 2018 rather than 2016, was I, I read, I'm not an architect, and if you, if you walk the product from a bit of ground, you'll soon realise I'm really not an architect, and I can co-opt a lot of the terms, but I was thinking of these works in architectural terms, in how do we understand space, and how, how even as a non-architect, how do I understand what that, what's happening in there when it's been thoughtfully designed and what runs? And so that's kind of stayed with me, and one of the things I want to do over the summer, or I'm doing next Wednesday in two weeks' time, is getting different practitioners in a room, giving them the project, get them to pull the whole thing apart, and say, remake it as if you're... Remake it because you're an architect. Remake it because you're an interior designer. Remake this purely as a creative writer, and seeing what happens. So I think that that's... That space, that when I, when we, if we leave, if we get, step away from this being literary and say, okay, those things work and we know broadly how those things operate to a certain degree, what happens when I give it to a completely different set of practitioners? And we still think about that set of, where are we? That set of things being important or what's the version of that that works with architecture? And it may come back to we're still thinking about stories, we're thinking about that being narrative-led or that being experiential. But I guess that's the space I think we're in at the moment, personally, for the project. I've got a sort of... Oh, oh. go on. Uh, hi, Tom. Uh, this is from Simon on YouTube. Um, do you think there is a geographic cultural limit to the form? Would there, uh, would there be difference in experience if there were one person in London and another in, an, in LA, for example? 
Thank you, Simon. Um, within the way it's designed, no. There isn't, there isn't a limit there. Technically, and sorry, I should thank Andy Wood and Josh Connor, who did the, um, you didn't get to mention this whole thing, who actually built the software end of it for me. As long as there's a phone signal, and that phone signal is semi-consistent, you can map that your house anywhere. And the fact that the accounts are then connected is a way through. So no, I don't think so. I think the interesting thing is what we think of as a house. I'm very conscious this was designed with a certain kind of literature, a certain kind of, there's, a, there's one of the, sorry, look at my laptop, one of the Substack posts lists obliquely all the haunted house stories I can think of, in the, and they're mostly from a Western tradition. And I'm guilty of that, and there, there are other ways to experience haunted houses. I think I, I lean into some Slavic things in there, but I think that if you are from a very different culture, and your, your understanding of what a haunted house is, is different than mine, I think that may push at the edges a little bit and that may open things out. Equally, I'm, it might actually open the thing out in a very different direction. But that's a, yeah, that's a, it's, that's a really straightforward question. I think, yes, no, it doesn't, but what you bring to it may completely alter. Mm. I'm going to ask a final question, unless anyone wants to challenge me on that. <laughs> um, OK. I'm not nervous now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about, so I guess we, we sort of hear quite a lot often around sort of attention spans and, um, and, the, and the work to um, enable people to like encounter work who may not be so familiar with yeah. it or competing with like all the different calls that there are on um, our like free time. Yeah. And it feels like what you've you've kind of purposefully designed something that's quite difficult, in some ways. I'm like really it, awkward. It asks quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, it of does. The, mm. Of your audience. Yeah. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that decision to ask ask for quite a lot of people. Yeah, I think when when Bitter Ground went from that first conversation around what if it's two books, it became a thing that got big quite quickly in my head. And what I knew, what was really interesting actually was the amount, the difference in the number of people who finished these pages second time around and first time around. I think what, when we, we, the original of these pages for like Ash, for those of you who didn't, it was a wooden book, um, sold from Watershed in 2013. As far as I know, one person read the whole thing. Ben Guacamai, I salute you still. <laughs> um, but the second edition, a lot more people engaged with the full three or four day experience. So I think I, I lent into that as going, okay, there might be an audience here. I think what's interesting, and we've had this conversation a little bit, and I've had it with Duncan about, there is something about the, the staging of that, that it is a moment, it's a thing you will do over four days. So actually, that there are about 150 copies out there, 30, no, 60 accounts have been created and about 30 or 40 of those are active is kind of what I expected. I kind of, that's better than I thought would be at this point. And that some people have run the whole four days. I think it's, the scale is quite big. I think what's different about this is the time is shorter. Um, and I was conscious of that when I was writing it, that not to just, not to compare it too closely with these, but these pages fall like ash is a walk across a city that you rewalk the same, you, you rewalk the points you mapped on day one and day two in different ways. Sorry, that unpacks in a whole different way. It's a different kind of ask. It's still a stage, it's still a big, it's still chapters, but that your time commitment within the piece is longer. This is actually shorter in those bits. It is, in a way, it's designed to be done in about 40 minutes each chunk. So in that respect, it's kind of, I'm, I was really aware of that. Yeah. Having said that, the next thing I want to do is going to be an hour long over an afternoon at most. I want to do something really short and really quick because there is something, there is something self-limiting about that grand scale of a thing. Hmm. There is, but I was just I was wondering as well if there's, a, if there's some value that you think is derived from it as well. From the scale? From, can... from the fact that you're having to, that you're working to figure out yeah. The form. I couldn't. There are things that there are things that take place in Forbitter Ground that wouldn't work if it wasn't four days long. Put it that way. You know, once it became, and the four days was a, it was a, an after effect of the seasonal version, that it's a whole year compressed into four days, and that four day thing kind of stuck, and it never really went away. And it became okay. Well, what does that do? 
and there are things that because you end it at certain, you end it at two o'clock or three o'clock, whatever else, a clock count starts counting down and the next chapter is available at midnight. I don't expect anyone's gone out at midnight and done the next bit, but that sense that there is a day is important in the narrative as well. It's part of what, it's part of the, your presence and your break between Monday to Tuesday is part of the story that's being told. So no, I think that, that wasn't accidental. No. It was deliberate in that. Um, I think the interesting thing comes back to this piece of work is designed to be a product and to go out there. Um, sorry, I should say it's available from all good websites that have my name on it at <laughs> £25. There are also two other editions. There is a very, very beautiful floating edition where the page of the books never meet. Um, but it's designed to be a thing that's out there in the world and that's part of the point of it. Having said that, having done something on this scale, I think what it's lent me back into is what's the four-day festival version? What if you ran this at Glastonbury? Not that I want to go to Glastonbury, but over a four-day thing that says a part of your ticket is you get this experience and over four days you will have this experience. It only asks half an hour of each day, but that you're set within a frame that means you're there in a location for a period of time. I think mapping those things is, is something that this piece has taught us I've taught me, shown me. Mm. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Um, it won't be six years before the next I one. I can't wait to do it next week. Um, so before we go, um, if you want to stick around um, with us for this afternoon and hot desk or find out a bit more about what we do, um, please come and find one of the studio team who are waving their hands at the back of the room. Um, and if you're watching us online and have any follow-up questions, you can drop us a line at studio at watershed.co.uk. We will see you the same time, same place next week, um, but we'll finish by giving you a final round of applause. Thank you.